See, when you deposit money into someone else's bank, that isn't your money anymore. You've given it away. It's their money. You just became a creditor to someone else's bank. Now they're on the hook to pay that money back to you, but they're going to pay it back to you on their terms. And they're just so reliable to make sure that the money's there. When you log in your online banking, you see all those numbers. We live in this world of illusion. We think that the money's actually there, but the bank is the one, they can't let that money sit still. They're the ones who are able to harness the motion, the energy of that capital. And they're putting that money to work to create profit. And they're not sharing any of that profit with you. Canada, welcome. Uh, I'm really just pleased that you're here. Congratulations. You made an excellent decision to be here because you know, there's many things that you could be doing with your time tonight, but you're making your family and your finances a priority. You're focusing on what you can control. And I think that that should be acknowledged because not everybody walking around these days is focusing on what they can control, right? It's all the noise and the things that are outside their control. And that is what drives us crazy. So congratulations. Now we're here to learn about the process of becoming your own banker. The first question that I have for you is who was our Nelson Nash? And let's just do a little thought experiment, Dan. So just let me know. Let's get some participation in the chat. Dan mentioned the Q&A window earlier. So that'll be for your questions, which we want you to hold for a while because we're gonna answer most of your questions as I go through the content here tonight. So just in the chat window, put in your answer. Who revolutionized the automobile industry with the Model T? Henry Ford, you got it. Now, well, the next question is, uh, who revolutionized a process to enable you to become your own banker? It was our Nelson Nash. And we're super uh, grateful. We owe a, a debt of gratitude that we cannot repay uh, to Nelson just because it was his own financial turmoil, his own financial ruin that really led to the discovery of the process of becoming your own banker, which I'm going to expand on because it's really important for us to understand the foundation. Anytime you want to do something in life, if you're building a building, you're building wealth, you're creating a banking system, we need to understand the foundation of where this process came from. How is it discovered? And if we're going to create a solution, we need to clearly understand the problem. So we're going to understand where the process of becoming your own banker came from. That's the first thing I'm going to drill down on. And then we're going to go from there. Okay. This is a, a quote that Nelson was famous for sharing often. Back in 1994, it took him nearly 13 years to finally get rid of what he referred to as the snakes and dragons and fire the banks completely. And he and his family never stepped foot into a commercial bank for the, anything other than the convenience of debit after 1994. And at that point, he said, what a peaceful, stress-free way of life it is when you get the banks out of your life. You'll know that you are capable of becoming your own banker. You're going to get clarity on the problem. It's really critically important because if we want to create a solution, we need to clearly understand the problem. Otherwise, the solution is not clear. So you're, you're going to get clear on the solution and you'll know what you can do. Again, just like I said earlier, focusing on what you can control. Now, here's a good question for you. What's the opposite of stress-free? Does it look, it's a little bit like this. I know that, uh, unfortunately, if I've experienced this from time to time and I just love this slide. Now, you've been taught to put your money into mutual funds and commodities and stocks and bonds. You've been taught to hand control of your money over to somebody else who thinks that they can do better with it than you can. You've been taught to put your money at risk. Basically, you're putting your money in a prison for many years, and then you're forced to go to someone else's bank to access more money when you need to purchase or finance the major items that you need to acquire in your life. And it's absolutely absurd. It just does not have to be that way. Now, I'm telling you that if you've been handing control of your money over to somebody else, you might not be in the best situation right now, but it's okay because it's not your fault. We do the best that we can with the knowledge and resources that we have, right? Now, I have a question. Are you committed to discovering the process of becoming your own banker? This is really important. Are you willing to commit to improve anything that you're now doing financially that is preventing you from becoming your own banker? Welcome to commitment. Enjoy your stay. Okay, now I discovered the path to a peaceful, stress-free financial life the hard way. You know, I was born in the 1980s, early 1980s, and uh, you can see that I've got some wisdom over here. And, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, right? Money wasn't even a conversation because it was more like, you know, an, an empty fridge and we're kind of wondering where that next meal was coming from. I moved a lot. I went to different schools, you know, 
learned later, obviously in life when I was really young, I didn't realize that we were, you know, getting evicted from houses and or apartments and stuff like that. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a, a, my mother was a single mother and, you know, I saw my dad from time to time and there wasn't a lot of conversations about money other than we don't have any. So I always felt like that was a scarce resource. And I, I call it God, call it divine law. I was lucky enough to always observe what was happening in my life and realize that I could see what people are doing, but I could also see people doing better. And I thought, well, it's clear to me that there's different attitudes and behaviors that the people who are doing better have versus what I was brought up around. Now, of course, I love my family and all those sort of things. So I think it was just a lesson that I was meant to learn for some reason. So I continued to go through life and, and I had the pro proper mentors and coaches that kind of came into my life at the right times to give me the right focus that I needed to keep pushing me through. Now, just like you, I mean, I had a lot of tough times, but all those tough times gave me really, really important lessons. So I continued to go through life and I started to, you know, I eventually got out of school and then I kind of had this belief that I just wasn't really a smart enough guy to do something uh, that I really wanted to do. I, I kind of had this belief that I wasn't really capable. I thought, you know, I struggled through school. So why should the rest of life be any different? And my family struggled. So why should life be any different? So I thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put my head down, my butt up, and I'm going to work really, really hard for someone else. And I'm going to earn the highest dollar per hour that I can. And I'm going to go ahead and get a pension. And, and don't get me wrong. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if that's what you're passionate about and what you choose to do. I did not choose it. It was really a default uh, thing for me to get into construction. And, uh, you know, throughout my 20s, I had kids really young and things were okay. But then what happened was I started to discover a personal development. I started to read books and I discovered, oh, wow, like, are you telling me that I actually have a say in how life goes like this? I'm not stuck this way. There's things that I can do to influence the outcome of how my life goes. And so guess what happened from there? Everything around my mid twenties took a huge uptick in the, it's been successes all along and all wins and the rest, as they say, is history. No, I'm kidding. It, it actually got worse <laughs> because I started to experiment. I started to try new things. I took big swings, major swings, and I made a lot of financial mistakes. And uh, not until, uh, you know, looking back now, I can discover that the problem was that I didn't have a coach. I didn't have the proper system to follow. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was, I was learning as I went and I just made a lot of mistakes and I was impatient. That was the biggest thing. I really didn't put the time and energy into learning, maybe mentoring or coaching under somebody else. And I made a lot of mistakes. But fortunately for me, uh, in the 2013, uh, after being licensed in the insurance industry, I, I made a switch. I got out of construction and I said, you know, I want to help people. I want to shower in the morning. I want to wear nice clothes. I want to make a difference and do something different and challenge myself. So I got into uh, financial services, but I wasn't in the right system. I didn't have the right team around me. I didn't have the right process. So I really, really struggled. That was in 2011. And then in 2013, I discovered Nelson Nash's book. And you'd probably think, oh, Vern, that must have been when things turned around for you. <laughs> but unfortunately, same thing. I, I, I didn't have, I wasn't the human being that I needed to be at that time to really take on this endeavor, not only just in my own life, but to coach other people to do it. So I didn't get the proper coaching. I didn't get the proper mentorship and I really didn't do the work that I needed to do. So I continued to struggle until around 2017 when I said, you know what, enough is enough. I always knew that this was the process, but again, that belief in my mind, I didn't think I could do it. But finally, I just said, you know what, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put in the work. And then within about a month from making that decision, I had my practitioner, uh, my authorized practitioner uh, certificate from the Nelson Nash Institute. And they say, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that is when I met my first mentor in the, in the, the process of becoming your own banker, a great friend of mine and a colleague named Richard Canfield. And he really helped me get my system started and helped me coach some other clients to get them started. And he's the one who actually introduced me to Jason Lowe and Ascendant Financial. And ever since August of 2019, I've been a member of the Ascendant Financial team. And, and as Dan mentioned, I've, I've now helped hundreds of families implement this process and my family and I have now expanded our system to 11 policies, and we're no longer dependent on the commercial bank for the need for financing. And we just live a peaceful, stress-free way of life. And every single day that we age, our, our net worth, our wealth actually increases. And you're going to learn how to do the same tonight. 
So it was not an easy journey, but I wouldn't change it because all of those mistakes that I made allow me to bring more value to my clients because, you know, I, they learned from what I was discovering. So that's the point. Now, here's what really stood out to me when I really started to read Nelson's book and, and start to implement this process. This is a, a picture that was taken a few years ago. Uh, my colleagues are in the back there. That was uh, Sarblo Gill in the middle, a great friend of mine. He's got the COVID cut. That was what we called that, the COVID cut. Had to cut his own hair. We were at Jason's uh, house and we were watching a 10-hour seminar from Nelson Nash. It was a 10-hour seminar that he actually developed this book from. <clears throat> and what I discovered was that we can never get a better rate of return investing into anything without first controlling the banking function as it relates to our needs, without controlling the financing function. And, and again, I'm going to share some examples later that will really illustrate that for you today. Now, most people believe that they need someone else to take care of their money. And most people believe that it's necessary to put their money at risk in order to grow it. Most people know next to nothing about the process of banking and more importantly, the importance of, of the process in their lives and, and their well being. I mean, banking is at the foundation of everything. Anything you want to do financially, banking is at the foundation and someone has to control that process. Now, here's the truth. The truth is the difference between you being stressed and staying relaxed financially is who controls the banking function in your life. Truth number two, you don't have to put your money in a prison for decades and rely on someone else to achieve the financial abundance that you deserve today. And truth number three, is that you don't have to be rich to become your own banker. Believe me, I, I know that firsthand. Who is this process actually for? That's something to think about. Well, the process is for you. That's why you're here tonight. Everybody needs capital, use of capital, and everybody needs the function of banking. So this process is for you. Now, how did infinite banking get started? You may recall, or maybe you heard stories about in the 1980s, the early 1980s, inflation skyrocketed. So interest rates went through the roof. And that, by the way, does that sound familiar? Sound like we might be headed on that sort of a trajectory. So interest rates went through the roof and the prime interest rate peaked at 21 and percent. And I've never met anybody who's at prime. You always have to pay more. Now, this is exactly what happened, happened to Nelson. At the time, Nelson Nash was a deep into a real estate investing and he was actually doing quite well. He was you know, renting properties, doing flips and doing all these kinds of things with real estate. And he was used to paying interest rates of somewhere around seven, eight, nine percent Still a little bit high, maybe by today's standards, but that's what he became accustomed to. And what happened was he got caught with $500,000 of mortgage debt. So just to be able to service that debt, you can imagine the kind of stress that that put him under because he wasn't at prime. He was at 21 and percent plus prime. So he was paying or plus, uh, plus, uh, plus one, plus one and a half. He was paying 23% interest just to service that $500,000 of, of mortgage debt. So he literally was on his knees praying for a solution. Uh, and luckily for us, uh, he, he discovered that solution. And he realized that the solution was in front of him all along. He had already been accustomed to paying large life insurance premiums into participating dividend paying whole life policies. And he realized that he could access capital from the directly from the insurance companies at six, seven and 8% and use that capital to pay off the snakes and dragons who were abusing him without interrupting the growth on that capital. And that's exactly what he did. And everybody thought he was crazy, including his wife, Mary, when he said, look, I understand the problem. I'm, I'm putting money into the system, into the, in, into the system in the wrong direction. I'm, I'm, everyone's getting all of my money and I'm doing all of the work. I'm being abused. That's the problem. And people thought, gosh, what are you talking about? Luckily, he just followed his intuition and he kept doing what he was doing. And then eventually, as I shared earlier, he was able to fire the snakes and dragons. In fact, uh, Jason shared a story with me. He, he told me that uh, Nelson had a, a business partner, somebody who was a uh, prominent lawyer in, in town there where Nelson was, was at in uh, Birmingham. And this lawyer ran into some financial problems as well, just like Nelson did. And that lawyer ended up eventually filing for bankruptcy. And Nelson could have done that as well. He could have filed for bankruptcy himself, but he chose not to do that. 
And not only did Nelson not file for bankruptcy and not only did he get rid of that $500,000 of mortgage debt, he recaptured that debt into his own system. It took him 13 years to get rid of all that debt. But he also bought out that business partner's share of the real estate deals that they were doing. He actually solved that problem as well. And Nelson, he had a life insurance policy that he put on that lawyer because they were doing business together and to protect the interest of your business. If something happens to your partner, if they pass away, cash can come in to solve that problem. So that's what Nelson chose to do. He had that life insurance policy for many, many years. And eventually when that lawyer passed away, the death benefit proceeds allowed Nelson to recapture all of the money that he had paid to solve that earlier problem and get rid of uh, the debt that the, the lawyer had as well. So you can imagine that long journey, what Nelson was going through. He just kept continuing to crank up more policies. Now, this is uh, something that Nelson was really great at. He was great at create, creating analogies. So everyone needs a heart. Would you agree? Absolutely. I want to tell you a story about Nelson. Uh, I believe the year was around 1989. Nelson uh, had a quarter bypass surgery, and he got hooked up to uh, a machine called a heart and lung machine. And the heart and lung machine was meant to pump the blood through the body to keep you alive while they opened up his chest cavity and the doctors did the good work that they needed to do. But obviously Nelson didn't remember all this because he was under uh, and he was, you know, conked out, right? He was, he was under. So, but when he uh, came to, he created this kind of vision in his mind and he realized, you know, he lived, he survived through that process, but he wasn't actually living. He was merely surviving. And so he started to realize when you abdicate the responsibility of banking to someone else, it's equivalent to living off a heart and lung machine financially, because the, the, the business of banking is all about putting money into the economy where it needs to go. It has to flow in order for things to happen. So that's what Nelson discovered. When we, somebody else is the banker, you're not thriving or living, you're merely surviving. Banking is the absolute most important business in the world. As I said earlier, without banking, nothing happens. Everything has to stay in constant motion. If you think about, you know, the blood circulating through your body or rivers and lakes and streams, you know, you would never drink water out of a stagnant pool because you could get really ill and it could even kill you. When things are not in motion, usually things die, right? If the air doesn't circulate on the planet, things die. It's the same with the money system. It's the same with the capital. It has to stay in constant motion. The banking system pumps money where it is needed. And at some point, it will flow through your hands and mine, right? We're going to use it. It's going to flow through our lives. And it's going to wind up. Where do you think it's going to wind up? It's going to wind up right back in the banking system. See, something to think about. There's actually only one pool of money on the entire planet. Think about the globe. There's rivers and lakes and streams. There's the, let's say the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean. For, for you to think that those are not all connected, you might not fully understand what's going on. Like they're all connected. There's only one pool of water. And you know, the sun is going to heat that water up and it's going to lift it into the atmosphere and it's going to move over to North America from somewhere in Europe and it's going to rain. And then some of that water is going to flow through our, our bodies and it's going to go right back into a river and then it's going to end up where? Right back in the ocean because there's only one pool of water. It's no different with the money system. It doesn't matter that there's, you know, different currencies and denominations and in, in banks and financial institutions, investment firms managing that money, at the end of the day, there's only one pool. And the issue with that, the issue with there being only one pool of money and it all winding up right back in the banking system is how much of the banking function do you control as it relates to your needs? As I said, there's only one pool of money on the entire planet. Okay, so that's something to think about. Now, what Nelson saw was that he was pumping money into the pool in the wrong way. He was pumping money into someone else's bank. All of the money is flowing to someone else's bank. He had to go through bankers and toll takers and gatekeepers who were all abusing him and making money off of him. 
Think about your own experiences as it relates to money and banking. Has that ever happened to you? What he realized is that he, had, he needed to crank up large life insurance premiums and build a system of policies. And that's not something that you can do overnight. Everyone thought he was crazy, including his wife, as I mentioned earlier. You have to get this done incrementally over time. I mentioned earlier that I have 11 policies in my system now. I, I didn't start with 11 policies. I built that over time. So it, it takes time and it takes commitment to do this. But as I always say to clients and people considering implementing this process, the time's going to go by anyway, isn't it? We're just going to continue doing what we're doing. Now, something that is really powerful that Nelson taught us is that there are four characters in the financial play. And one of the things that Nelson said is most people don't realize that there are four are characters in the play at all. They don't even realize that a play is going on and they get all the characters in the play all mixed up. So tonight we're going to organize and determine what are the four characters and, 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 and what are their roles. Now, the four characters in any financial transaction, you are a depositor. I'm a depositor. We're all depositors. So we have capital. It's got to be deposited. We're all borrowers. It doesn't matter if you're borrowing money alone or if you're using cash that, that you saved up. You're either going to pay interest to someone else or you're going to give up interest you otherwise could have earned. So it's, it's all considered borrowed money. Depositor, depositor is character number one. The borrower, borrower is character number two. Well, the third character in the financial play is the banker. Well, what does the banker do? The banker is the one who is going to set all the terms, tell you the interest rate, and grant you access to the money. And what about the bank owner? Well, the bank owner is the one who is receiving all of the money. They're making most of the money in the transaction. Why? Well, remember the golden rule. This might be new to you. People have abdicated the responsibility and the, and the opportunity as it pertains to the banking function in the economy. They're depending on someone else to perform the job. And that character in the financial play is making most of the money, and rightfully so, because of the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. It's as simple as that. It, it's no two ways about it. And the person on the street in Canada today understands the subject so poorly that it is that he's doing the equivalent of living off the heart and lung machine. They're merely surviving, they're merely existing financially because someone else is controlling the banking function as it relates to their needs. Now, what I want to talk to you about is how to create a system which will, uh, which will allow you to control everything about the banking function as it relates to your needs. And that's, after all, the most important thing. It's what you need. Showed this book earlier. The Becoming Your Own Banker, the book that Nelson self-published, I believe, in the early 2000s. And there's been over, I think the number is actually closer to 500,000, if not more. That's pretty amazing for a self-published book. I don't know of any book that's sold uh, nearly 500,000 that was self-published. But more importantly, why would, would that book have sold more than 500,000 copies? Well, it's simple. It's because it works. The very first principle that you must uh, understand or that you have to come to understand is that you finance everything that you buy. I mentioned that earlier with you're either borrowing or you're using cash and it's either earning interest or giving up interest. This comes directly from Nelson's book. You either pay interest to someone else or you're otherwise you're giving up interest you otherwise could have earned. And there are no exceptions to this rule. The whole idea is to recapture the interest that one is paying to banks and finance companies for the major items that you need to finance during your lifetime. And the, ob the objective is to keep the money in the family. Think about that. All of the money that's flowing away, yourself, your, your kids, everybody's going to be buying houses and financing cars and doing all that. Keep the money in the family. The money's got to flow anyway. It may as well stay in the family instead of flow to somebody else. How do you do that? The question is, how much of the banking function do you control as it relates to your needs? Now, this is a, a, a something that you need to understand, a fundamental truth. Your wealth, your money, it must reside somewhere. It has to have a home. It's going to come in. It's got to be deposited. Someone must perform the banking function. Someone's got to distribute that capital, and that someone should be you. 
It's that simple. The process is not an either or. Becoming your own banker is not about addressing a yield on investment. It's all about how you go about financing things that you need throughout your life that certainly could include investments. So this process isn't like, hey, I want to buy cryptocurrency or become my own banker. I want to invest in real estate or become my own banker. I want to pay off all my debt or become my own banker. No, it's I want to pay off my debt and become my own banker. I'm going to become my own banker to help accelerate and enhance anything that I'm doing finance or financially today, including investments. Now, we're going to talk about getting into the grocery store business. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, like, I, I came here to learn how to become my own banker. Why are we talking about getting into the grocery store business? Well, by the end of this example, you're going to have a clear understanding why we're using the grocery store as an analogy. If you're going to get into the grocery store business, what do you have to do? Well, you need to first consider a business in which you are both the consumer and the seller of the product. You have a market that is unlimited because everybody uses groceries, much like banking. Someone has to perform the function of distribution, right? Again, just like banking and the money. Now, you're going to study the business for a couple of years. You're going to get a mentor. You're going to get a coach. You're going to learn about the business. You're going to purchase a superior location because location, 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 right? And you're going to build an attractive building so that it attracts eyeballs. Somebody's going to see a nice building. They're going to want to go in there. And then you need to stock the shelves with high quality merchandise. If it's not high quality merchandise, people aren't going to stick around your store for very long. Now, you need to turn the inventory at least 15 times just to break even. The, the, the profits on the grocery store items are, are very low. But if you turn it 17 times, you'll become profitable. And if you can turn it 20 times, you can retire early. Now, let's think about our grocery store here. We're going to have the groceries or that we're going to use a can of peas as an example here. The cans of peas are being sold for 60 cents, but they're being bought for 57 cents. So that means we're only earning three pennies. Again, the, the yields are, are very low on this, on this uh, capital. And now I'm fortunate that uh, my wife does the shopping in my house. She buys the grocery stores. The first thing that you got to think about is if you owned a grocery store, would you ever go and shop for groceries at someone else's grocery store. If you're watching right now, do like this. No way, I would never do that. <laughs> of course not. So this question is for, for you, uh, Canada. I want you to tell me, you're shopping at your own grocery store. You're the owner of the business, right? So when you fill up your grocery store cart and you're you know going through the aisles here, are you gonna take the groceries out the back door and pay wholesale cost for them, 57 cents, or are you going to take the groceries out the front door and pay retail cost just like everybody else? Think about this for a moment. If you, if you go out the back door, you're, every can of peas is only producing three pennies in profit. So if you go out the back door, you're going to have to sell 20 cans of peas to make up for that lost revenue. And if you start going out the back door, what do you think the employees are going to do? They're going to follow your lead and they're going to go out the back door. So if you want to have a fun thought experiment, make fun, make friends with somebody who has a retail store or owns a grocery store and ask them who is responsible. Where is, where is most of the theft coming from within the business? And you might be surprised to see that it's from the employees. So think about your family. If you're going out the back door and you're not paying, you're not paying uh, retail costs for those goods, they're going to follow your lead. In other words, if I'm accessing policy loans from my policy system and I don't pay back my policy loans with interest, that's equivalent of theft or stealing from my own banking business. The more capital that I flow into my grocery store, i.e. my banking business, the more inventory we're going to be able to purchase, the more profitable the business is going to become. And I don't think anybody who runs a, a grocery store or a business that deals with inventory like that is going to be upset about having more inventory on their shelves to sell to captive customers. Now, we're not going to just pay back 60 cents. We're not going to just go through the front door and pay what everybody else pays. Nelson taught us to what if we paid 62 cents? You're putting more dollars, more pennies back in the cash register to make your business even more profitable so you can create even more inventory and you can create more wealth and abundance, more freedom. It's the same with my banking system. If I 
pay back more than what the life insurance company is asking me for, then I'm just going to have more capital in my system growing and expanding so that I can take advantage of more opportunities. So Nelson taught us, don't steal the peas. Once you understand the grocery store example, the rest of becoming your own banker is ridiculously simple. Now, here's the problem. Wherever wealth resides, someone will try to steal it. So ask yourself, who is the banker in your life today? If I'm storing my cash in someone else's bank, there's a lot of eyeballs that can see that capital there. So just think about that for a little bit. Now, everyone here earns an income, right? You earn an income and that income gets deposited into someone else's bank. The key words here are someone else's. It's going to someone else's bank. You're playing by someone else's rules. See, when you deposit money into someone else's bank, that isn't your money anymore. You've given it away. It's their money. You just became a creditor to someone else's bank. Now, they're on the hook to pay that money back to you, but they're going to pay it back to you on their terms. And they're just so reliable to make sure that the money's there. When you log into your online banking, you see all those numbers. We live in this world of illusion. We think that the money's actually there, but the bank is the one, they can't let that money sit still. They're the ones who are able to harness the motion, the energy of that capital. And they're putting that money to work to create profit. And they're not sharing any of that profit with you. Then what happens is you go and you access that money and you pay bills. In other words, you're doing all the work and someone else is getting all of your money. How does that make you feel? Like this? <laughs> I love this slide too. Jim Carrey is one of my favorites. So I, I'm trying to make light of this, but by now you, you should be getting kind of angry. You should be getting a little red in the face. Just if you really think about what is actually going on out there in the banks, we've been convinced that we need them. We don't need them. They need us. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, we're going to think about two different ways of financing things throughout our life. You can either be a debtor, you can, you can borrow from someone else and you can make payments, right? So this person needs a vehicle or whatever it is, they're going to start at zero and then they're going to qualify for a loan and then they're going to drop below the line, they're going to go into debt and now they have to make a regular payment to someone else's bank on someone else's terms for many, many years, just so that it can get back to zero. And then they're going to repeat the process. And they're always giving up control and motion of that money to someone else in that energy of that capital. Now, if you keep on making these payments, what happens if life occurs, and there's something that gets in the way to interrupt those payments? Well, it could be a very uncomfortable situation. Somebody could come and get your stuff. You don't actually own anything until the final payment is made. Now, the other alternative is to become the saver. A lot of times people think, you know what, I'm just going to go and I'm going to give up the motion of my money and I'm going to give up control over my money and I'm gonna pile it up in someone else's bank. And I don't want to make payments. I don't want to pay interest. I, I want to avoid all that. I'm going to just uh, pay cash for this major expense. And then what happens? Well, it's the very same thing as the debtor. They access the money from someone else's bank. They pay for their thing. They've got the car, but now all of their money is gone. And now they got to repeat the entire process. And this to me looks a lot like a payment. You don't actually get any further ahead by financing things through using cash. The debtor, this person can actually see the interest that they're paying because it's all part of their payment. They, they saw that when they made the financing arrangement. But the saver, this person doesn't see the opportunity, the interest that they could have otherwise earned if they didn't spend that money. See, each method is a permanent transfer away from you. That's the problem that Canadians are facing. The money is flowing away. And every payment that you make is a deposit in someone else's bank. So I may finance and make a payment and I'm paying interest and I'm also giving up interest that I otherwise could have earned. So it's kind of a double whammy. But if I save up capital 
and constantly interrupt the motion or interrupt the momentum on that money and then transfer it away, it's a permanent transfer and I give up opportunity to grow that money. It's gone forever. And not only for me in this generation, but every generation that comes after me. Think about my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids. I want to keep that money in motion and keep that money in the family for generations to come and create a peaceful, stress-free financial life and generational wealth. Now, now that we've clearly framed up and understood the problem, we're going to dive into the solution. So I'm going to give you a minute to just take a deep breath. Don't shoot the messenger, okay? <laughs> but that's okay. We, we identify the problem. Now we're going to clearly start looking at what is the solution? Well, the solution is clear. It's becoming your own banker. If the money's flowing away to someone else's bank, if I become the bank, the money's going to flow back to me and my family. Think about this. Every dollar that you earn, your money must reside somewhere. It's got to be positive. Excuse me. We're going to do a fun thought experiment where we're going to create the perfect investment from scratch. Now, this is really important. The only condition is that there can be no drawbacks to this investment. So I want you to start thinking about what would be the perfect investment? What attributes would be included with the perfect investment? And I'll tell you what, I'll help you get started with some of our most popular uh, answers. So always the first one, Dan's always high rate of return, right? Exactly, yep. We want a consistent rate of return. We want it to be conservative or safe, liquid. We heard that a lot. Guaranteed tax benefits or tax-free. Uh, market, no market volatility, yields uh, income besides capital gains. We got creditor protection. So someone said that private, I believe. Inflation protected. I think I heard that one too. Control, transferable. I think someone said reoccurring. So maybe that's what they meant was, was uh, transferable. Uh, easy to manage. That sounds really good. No hidden fees or penalties. Reputable. So well-known uh, and, and been around for a long time. Private. That's my favorite one. Now, what I want you to do is for your own various assets, simply identify which features from the above list that they do well on and which features do they fail to satisfy. Now, I've got a surprise for you. The list of attributes that was shared most accurately describes a participating dividend paying whole life policy. So you might've heard us saying that earlier, the policy is the tool. It's the best tool that we've been able to find to implement the process of becoming your own banker. Becoming your own banker is not a product. It is a process, but we need a tool to implement the process. Like I joke with clients all the time and say, look, you could get go, go out on your knees and hands and knees and cut your grass with scissors, but it's not really an effective tool for the job. So you could save up capital in a shoebox, but that's not a very effective tool for implementing the process of becoming your own banker. We want something maybe that you could ride on or maybe a push mower, something with some fuel, right? And that's where the participating dividend paying whole life policy comes in. So what does that mean, participating? Well, you become a co-owner in the mutual life insurance company and you participate in the profits generated from every line of business. Think about a life insurance company, all of the products that they actually sell, they all generate profit. Each year, the life insurance company declares a dividend and it is contractually guaranteed to pay, uh, to be paid to participating policy owners and it can never be repossessed or ever lose value. It only goes in one direction, whole life. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're, uh, you are the life insured and the whole life uh, for your whole life until age 100. The cash value, so the, the cash value in the policy must equal the total death benefit by age 100. So every single day that you age, the total cash value must rise. The policy cannot lose value. Now, we don't have many financial guarantees anymore. Pensions are going by the wayside. There is doubt about the future. And however, dividend paying whole life insurance can help create peace of mind and unmatched financial security. And here's how. So the cash value begins to accumulate immediately and it is contractually guaranteed to grow daily, every single day. Cash value cannot go down. It's easy to access and control over the growing pool of financial value that you can use to take advantage of opportunities that will track you down. You cannot be penalized for accessing it early 
uh, like you are with RSPs or other financial products. Uh, there are several tax advantages, both personally and corporately. Uh, it provides a growing death benefit, which is paid to the named beneficiary income tax-free upon the death of the insured. So we want to make sure that we live a nice life and we are taken care of financially, but we want to make sure that our family never has a bad financial day as long as we're here or after we're gone. You are your greatest advantage. I always say that you're already reliable. You're already some bank's really good customer. You're already making payments to somebody else. So why not be able to make payments to our own system? Now, this green line here that you can see, that represents the daily cash growth, the rising growing pool of financial value in the cash value chasing that total death benefit by your age 100. Now, let's say you're capitalizing this policy for a while. And now the opportunity comes up or that need, just like the debtor saver a slide that I showed earlier, you have a car or a, a major purchase you need to make, or maybe there's a great investment that you want to make that's going to create some really good cash flow, or maybe we're accessing a loan to eliminate a debt that you already have to free up a payment that's flowing away. Well, now we're going to borrow from our own policy. And this, these stairs here, just like the debtor saver example, that represents the policy loan repayments that you're making back to your own system. And we're going to make these payments and we're going to get all the way back to the point where we pay back the entire loan. But you can see that by the time that we've done that, the cash value continues to rise and you have access to more capital. It's a growing pool of financial value that will allow you to take advantage of even more opportunities and create more wealth for your family. And we just continue to keep repeating the process and it just keeps getting better and better. Creating your own banking system. We're not just winging it here, okay? Nelson gave us some really important rules to follow. So here are Nelson's five golden rules that he left behind for us. Think long range. He taught us to think three generations ahead. I'm currently building a system. I have policies on my own life. I have policies on my kids. And I'm thinking about my own, my, my potential unborn grandkids and great grandkids. I'm thinking long range. That's why I'm building up a large system on, on my kids as well. Don't be afraid to capitalize. Remember, your wealth must reside somewhere. The deposits have to be made anyway. So all your money's flowing away to someone else's bank anyway. We, how much of that capital do we want to carve out and start building your own banking system with? Don't be afraid to capitalize. Don't steal the peas. If you're going to access policy loans, make sure that you pay those policy loans back with interest. Pay back more than what the life insurance company is asking for so we can contribute to the profitability of the insurance company that you co-own and you'll have access to more capital day after day after day. You can go back and re-access everything that you pay back plus whatever grows every day. Don't do business with banks. Some people don't realize that when you're borrowing from a bank, that's how the bank inflates the money supply. That's how the value of the dollar is being driven down right now because they're just printing money like crazy. And that bill has to be paid. It's going to be paid in the form of taxes and rising costs. So don't do business with banks. Now, this is a fifth golden rule that we later found out. Jason does a much better job of framing this up because he's really humbled by this. But Nelson Nash's son-in-law, David Stearns, shared with Jason after Nelson passed that this fifth golden rule, rethink your thinking. He added this golden rule and he, and he got that from Jason. So Jason was really honored to hear that. We have to rethink our thinking. An old idea has to leave and it has to be replaced by a new idea. Now, this is for families, uh, individuals, business owners, the process of becoming your own banker. We have the need for the use of banking personally. We have the need for the use of banking corporately. Just think about if you have a a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, if you have, um, you know, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, they all have the need for the use of money and they all need banking in their lives. This is Dave Klein. He says, two years after opening our first policy, we took out our first policy loan and paid off the bank loan on my wife's Subaru, redirecting the payments from the commercial bank to our family bank, redirect the payments. You're already making the payment, send it back to your own bank. Three years later, five years now into their journey, we took out another policy loan and skipped the bank entirely. 
this time using the money to buy me a brand new Subaru or, or a brand new SUV outright. Uh, in, in year five, we also had another child and took out a policy loan, a policy on him and a second policy on myself. With five policies now in force after seven years, our mortgage came up, was coming up for renewal. Instead of renewing with our commercial bank, we took out pol a policy loan from each of our five policies, five policies, one system, and paid off the mortgage altogether. So imagine that they paid off their mortgage early and was, were able to skip the bank entirely and send that payment right back to their own system and recapture the capital that was already leaving them. Now, at this point, you might be thinking this to yourself. The most common question that I get, I get is, uh, can we connect with somebody or the right person on your team to take a look at my financial situation and show me how to become my own banker? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely. If you've already been engaging with one of our teammates, if you're already familiar with this process, sometimes people ask me this question, they go, Vern, do I have to book another call? No, you don't have to book another call uh, if you're already chatting with somebody, but if you're new to the process, all you have to do is text the word schedule to this number, 780-809-4599. Text the word schedule to 780-809-4599 and you can reserve a date and time that works best for you. It's a 15 minute, no obligation call that will help you uh, determine if uh, this process is gonna be a good fit, if there's a good basis for us to work together and or, and or what the next steps are gonna be. There might be some additional resources that you're gonna want to um, consume to really wrap your mind around the concept. Because remember, the title is Becoming Your Own Banker. It's not creating a dependent relationship on your advisor or your coach. It's creating an independent relationship. We're here to coach you to implement the process so that you can have more independence in your life. I'm assuming you wouldn't be on this call if you wanted to create more dependency in your life. You want to create more independence. I know, and you should know deep down that you are capable of becoming your own banker. Here is the uh, follow-up that you can expect from us, okay? Because we're going to keep in touch from, with you. Uh, we'll stay in touch by email. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time and you'll receive uh, an invite to schedule a date and time. If we don't hear from you first, you'll receive an invite to schedule a call. And if we don't hear from you, the right advisor on our team will extend a courtesy call uh, just to find a mutually convenient time to meet, okay? Now, if you prefer not to meet, that's okay. Just simply let us know. and. Um, as long as you leave happy, that's okay with us. Fair enough? Okay, great. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share another quick uh, testimonial from a past client or a current client who implemented the policy system in the past. Now, this is a great example of family banking. Yeah, being, this is one of the things that stood out is being able to finance one's purchases without paying interest to a bank is great. I'm going to scroll down and share a highlight here. After three years of building our policies, we already had acquired enough cash value that we could withdraw, it should say borrow, borrow enough money from our policies to pay off the bank on our rental real estate properties 13 years early. Look at that, amazing. Think about the rental income that's coming in. The bank is receiving most of that money. It's being trapped in the equity in the home, but they're now receiving that in their banking system. That was a huge accomplishment knowing that we are now really using IBC, the infinite banking concept, as it was intended. When our oldest daughter and son-in-law decided to purchase their home, they were able to access a loan from her policy that we had started and also fund uh, funds from our policies to buy their home as a cash deal and not have a mortgage from a traditional bank. Currently, they are making payments back to us for the loan interest and or of the bank, thus keeping the idea of keeping the money in the family. Now just imagine that for a moment for you and your family. Again, like I said, your, your kids, your grandkids, everyone needs the use of financing and money and they're already sending the money away. They're already sending the money away from the family. What if we could find a way to keep that money in the family? If you're approaching retirement, maybe your kids are just starting out. Maybe you've got the capital. 
Well, if you've got the capital, maybe you could become the bank and that cash flow can flow to you. And then you're keeping that money in the family and actually building a legacy at the very same time. And you get to use the process of becoming your own banker as a teaching tool. Now, let's uh, compare how 99% of Canadians, the Canadian public buy cars to becoming your own banker. Now, each of these methods require an ongoing payment, a consistent transfer of capital away from you. You have the no purchase plan, which is called leasing. You have the pre-purchase plan, which is financing. You don't own anything until your final payment, just like the debtor saver example. Or we've got the pre-purchase plan. So there's the debtor and saver right there. You save cash and spend the cash. And where are we saving the cash? In someone else's bank. Now, each of the above methods, who is getting all of your money? That's right, someone else's bank. It's kind of a theme here, right? The money is always flowing to the bank. Now, here's a question. Dan, I'll, I'll get you to jump in here. And I know that uh, your answer is always the most popular, Dan. <laughs> I think, anyway. How many vehicles have you and your family purchased in your lifetime? Either cash, lease, or financed. Those are the three different methods. For me, my number is three. Dan, tell us your uh, wildly insane number. Well, it's over 14, Fern. I uh, stopped counting at 14. Fair enough. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. What'd you say? What do you say, Dan? Are we going 30,000, 40,000? What's the average cost, do you think, to a Canadian right now buying a car? Yeah, it's got to be 35, I'd say. Somewhere in that average. Right in the middle. Higher, somewhere Let's less. 35,000 times 50 cars. And I think that was a, a modest uh, response. So we have almost 2 million, it's $1.75 million of capital that is permanently flowed away. Think about the energy, think about what that capital could have grown into. That money's gone forever and we'll never get it back. How many more vehicles are you and your family planning to buy for the remainder of your lifetime? We're gonna buy more vehicles. This is just one example. There's so many other things that we need to finance. Now, People are likely to spend more financing vehicles throughout their lifetime than they will ever save for, for retirement. That, that's a sad story. That's the problem that Canadians are facing. And that's the problem that we're here to solve because it just does not have to be that way. Now, um, August of 2021, uh, this is me, Vern. I decided to buy out this vehicle. I still have this vehicle today, my Ford F-150. I don't want to get any shots in the comments. I'm not a truck guy. It's very wonderful and reliable. You might be uh, uh, criticizing me right now for having a Ford, but I'm sure if it was any other car, you'd want to make a comment about that as well. The loan balance was $34,000 at the time. Now, what were my options? I could pay cash. I could refinance or maybe lease it somehow or become your own banker. Let's see what happens. Well, here's something to think about before I do that. What is the lost opportunity cost on choosing one of the options over the other, paying cash, leasing, or financing? I'm gonna give you right now just a visual for you to think about, okay? This is just a visual illustration of what happens every single time we spend a dollar, okay? This is just a basic, what they call, it's a, called an opportunity cost calculator. So what I'm doing here is I'm just gonna use the paying cash option, okay? Let's imagine that I saved up cash somewhere, 34,000 bucks, I wanted to get rid of that payment. So I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take all my hard earned money and I'm gonna transfer it to someone else's bank so that I can now own the vehicle outright and not have to make a payment again. So it was 34,000 that I owed at the time. And I'm picking a very, very conservative interest rate. And again, this is just a hypothetical saying that imagine I could leave this $34,000 growing uninterrupted and at a rate of 3%. Now I'm hoping that I'll far outlive this number. I'm 38 years young today. Statistics Canada says that I'll be around for approximately another 48 years. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate my 34,000 by 3% interest if I was growing that for the next 48 years uninterrupted. 
Now, this is what Nelson taught us. Whenever you make a $34,000 decision, I'm not making a $34,000 decision by spending my own cash on that car. I'm making more than a $143,000 decision just from that one transaction because of the lost opportunity cost. Remember, I'm either going to pay up interest to someone else because I had to tap into their pool of money, or I'm going to give up interest I otherwise could have earned. And so this is just a potential of interest that I could have earned. I can tell you if it was a quarter of that number, I'm still really upset because my money's gone forever and I'll never get it back. Now, luckily for me, I uh, discovered the process of becoming your own banker. Let's talk about the process because I chose becoming your own banker. First things first, I capitalized my policy. Don't be afraid to capitalize because your money must reside somewhere. I requested a policy loan for 34,000 using my cash value as collateral because I chose the process of becoming your own banker. Now, don't do business with banks. I got rid of the bank and I used money from my own system. Now the insurance company placed a lien on the death benefit for the, uh, for the, for the 100% of the loan and my cash value just kept growing every single day, every day uninterrupted, just like I showed in that lost opportunity cost calculator. I'm not interrupting the growth of my cash value. Now I control the repayment schedule and I decided to repay my policy loan at $700 per month. Now my payment to uh, Ford was only $600 per month or $299.37 bi-weekly. But I decided, because I get to do that, I ramped up my payment. I'm actually putting more back in the system. So over 60 months, I'll pay $42,000 back to my system. And now every time I make a $700 payment back to my own system, I'm actually able to go back and reaccess $1,000 from my policy. And take a minute and just think about what I just shared there. Let that sit with you. Remember, don't steal the peas. A thousand is a lot bigger than 700. Now, heaven forbid, if uh, something were to happen to me, my family receives the death benefit minus the loan balance and they still own the truck. So think long range. I'm thinking, okay, if I go and put my, uh, my own money or my family at risk by Financing a vehicle, if something were to happen to me, if I don't have a plan in place, well, they're left with that debt. They have to deal with that. But what I did was I created the system. God forbid something happens, they're going to be taken care of. They're never going to have a bad financial day. The question that I have for you is, where did the money come from to buy the truck? And who owns the truck? And who gets all of the money? All right. So the money that you used to buy the truck out from Ford came from the life insurance company. That's right. You but, own the truck. Correct. And who gets all the money? Well, so as you pay that back, everything you pay, you'll get the access again. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Now, what happens if I choose to stop or modify my policy loan repayment or the amount or the schedule? What, what What's going to happen, Dan? Well, there's, you know, that's a choice you get to make, Vern, because you own the contract. Now, you can stop it. You can take a vacation from your payments. You can make all those decisions. And again, you can increase the amount you're paying or decrease the amount of paying, extend the amortization period or shorten the amortization period. Now, so if, what if happens I if you decide not to? Well, nothing. You're not going to get a call from the life company saying, hey, Vern, what happened? You stopped making payments. So really there's going to be nothing to happen other than there's going to be an interest. You know, interest gets accrued on what you owe to the life company. So that's just going to grow. And it, and if you don't pay it back at all, it will continue to grow. But that would be why we teach people not to steal the peas because you always want to pay your interest back and be an honest banker. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Now, uh, how much of the money that I put toward the policy loan repayment can I actually use again? Okay, every penny. Awesome. Every single penny, including the interest that I pay back to my own system. Now, I get the truck, I have all the money, and I recaptured all of the interest. If you can do this with cars, or in my case, a truck, 
Is there anything that you can't do this for? Rethink your thinking. We're sending all of our money away and it doesn't have to be that way. When I access a policy loan, I do, I do have to pay interest. Now, think about that for a moment. Let's imagine for a moment that Dan and I were business partners. If I knocked on Dan's door and I said, hey, Dan, can I borrow a loan? We got some money in our corporation. I have a need for the use of money. Would you be okay if I borrowed some money from the business? I think so. Under the right conditions, Fern, we could arrange that. Interesting. So if I borrow money from our business, Dan, are, are you going to let me do that for free? I don't think so, Vern. I like you and everything, but you know, I think it would be uh, really good for our business if you know we took that capital that we built there and got some return on it. So if you're going to use it, I think you know my expectation is that you would pay something for the use of that money. Okay, so I borrow the money from the business and I'm going to pay back more to our business than what I used because... If I take the money out of the business to use it somewhere else, what is it not doing in the business? It's not doing anything. You took it out. It's not working. It's not growing. It's not helping us in any way, is it? Exactly. Okay, great. Now, you own policies with a mutual insurance company. I own policies with a mutual insurance company. So if I borrow capital, if I borrow a loan from the mutual insurance company that we co-own, we're business partners, right? We are. So... I have to pay interest on my policy loans because the life insurance company has an obligation to generate a profit. They got to put money to work to grow profit. Oh, by the way, who are they sharing that profit with? Hey, they share it with us. Like we right. get we get to share all the profits from that life company. So hey, if when you're paying that interest back, Vern, I wish it was like 10%. Because that life company is going to put that work to money work, money to work for you and I. And it's just going to increase the profitability, which they share with us. So this is all about rethinking our thinking, right, Dan? People think, right. oh, I got to borrow money. I got to pay interest. No, you co-own the lender. You're yep. already paying interest to someone else anyway, and it's not doing a lick for you. So why not pay interest back to a company that you co-own where you can go back and reaccess all of it anyway, and we get to share in that divisible profit. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate you. You're welcome. So yes, the answer is yes. I absolutely do have to pay interest on my policy loans and, and I uh, don't have a single problem with it. Now, the process of becoming your own banker is a process that will allow you to finance things throughout your lifetime and, and grow capital uninterrupted and give you absolute total and absolute control and unmatched financial peace of mind and, and a, stre a stress-free financial life. Now, what's great about the process in my mind is that when I access a policy, a policy loan, excuse me, I'm not robbing from or stealing from future opportunities. I'm creating momentum all the time. So I can actually multitask my dollars and create sort of a multi-level solution if I wanted to do that with my policy system, because I'm just growing an ever increasing pool of financial value. So what we're talking about in this example here is a case study of personal guaranteed retirement solution. Now I want you to meet Nasia, age 45, she had a very specific objective. Now that's really important as well. When we're implementing the process or any kind of solution we wanna create, we have to have a specific objective to have $39,000 of net retirement income or annual income from age 65 to age 90. The deposits into the policy system were 30,000 into her dividend paying whole life policy for 10 years. Now we can capitalize beyond the 10 year period, but this was a very specific solution that Nasi wanted to create. She wanted to know that if she decided to stop depositing premium after 10 years, could she do that? And that's exactly what she did with the option to continue to, to, to do to deposit premium. And if she continues to deposit premium, policy is just gonna work harder. The total deposits were 300,000. Now from age 65 until age 90, Nasia can access 39,825 or $27 tax-free. So I apologize. She's taken a little bit more money out of the policy. I hope that's okay with everybody. And uh, the key words there are tax-free. I think that's probably pretty important to everyone. Now, the total out of the policy is $1,035,502. And that's a lot more than what she put in. Nasia passes away at age 91 and leaves $586,682 to her beneficiaries, income tax-free. 
were the same $300,000 worth of deposits that would have went to somebody else's bank anyway. Now, it takes time to build this up, but the time's going to go by anyway. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is it easier to save $300,000 inside of a policy or accumulate $1,035,502 inside of a mutual fund or an RSP? In fact, you'd have to accumulate a lot more than that likely because every dollar that's coming out of the RSP is 100% taxable. So just allow yourself to think about that for a second. Which one do you think would be easier? Awesome. Now, again, this process works for investors and for business owners as well. Families need money in, in banking, capital, as do investors and business owners. There are some additional benefits that come with owning policies corporately or implementing the process uh, on the corporate side. And so what we would encourage you to go to the Bankers Vault. I'll show you this channel a little bit later, but if you haven't already checked out our YouTube channel, I would encourage you to go to Bankers Vault because there's a lot of other case studies there that can help business owners understand some of the advantages that come with corporate owned life insurance. And uh, I'll plant a seed here. Uh, you're, you're probably familiar with the words capital dividend account, and you're looking for tax advantages so there's a lot of uh, uh, inf interesting information there. And my colleague, Henry, is an absolute expert. He's a ninja when it comes to uh, how taxes work in Canada. So I just wanted to plant that seed that this is not just for the family or the individual. It's also for investors and business owners. And I don't think any investor or any business owner would complain about having use and control and access to more capital and tax advantage growth on capital. OK, unless I'm alone here in that, but I don't think so. Now, I want you to think about, as I mentioned earlier, your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids, you might never meet them, but you can do something for them today that they do not have the power to do for themselves. You can start to build a system not only on your own life, but you can build a policy system on your kids, your grandkids and your great grandkids. And that all can form a part of the family banking system. We've been taught in Canada We've been taught to be divisive in the family. You've been taught, hey, you're going to get your own job and your own problems and your own car and your own house and your own family. Well, the wealthy don't think that way. They, they circle the wagons and they find ways to keep the money in the family. Whoa, where'd that come from? This is uh, Jason's wild uncle, Chuck. <laughs> I was just having a little fun here. He doesn't get invited to any of the family banking meetings anymore because this is an actual photo. This is a picture of Jason's family. Now, every single person in this photo is actually life insured, and they're all practicing the process of becoming your own banker in their own lives. They, the, the entire family has worked together and educated themselves. And of course, Jason's leading the charge. And this, in my mind, is the absolute gold standard for how to operate the family banking system. They have no debt outside of the family. All of those payments are flowing back to the family. They're recapturing more than $26,000 a month of payments that otherwise would have been flowing to someone else's bank because there's such a volume there, such a large amount of people in the family that are participating in the process. And just imagine the financial peace and, and the stress-free uh, stress way of life that that creates. In fact, you can see that they all have t-shirts on that says annual family banking meeting. I, I could be wrong about this, but I know it was an annual family trip. They go on a trip every single year, the entire family, and they meet and they talk about, okay, well, how do we want to grow the system? What do we want to achieve? Where are we at with things? And they, I think they were on a cruise here for this one. So I've started to implement this with my family. I have a 12 year old daughter and a 14 year old son and my beautiful wife, Crystal, we're all life insured. And I'm now planting the seeds with my in-laws as well. And, and they understand uh, how this process works. In fact, I did a private loan from my own system to uh, our families. Uh, we have a construction company in our family. I did a private loan to that, uh, to that corporation and loaned them $26,000 to buy out some uh, vehicle financing. And that money that was flowing away, that capital that was flowing away from the business, it's now flowing back to us. It's coming back to the family. So we're already starting to implement the process of family banking as well. And you can do the same. The one last thing that I should mention about that is all these people are life insured. The reason why they're all life insured and why that matters is because when someone passes, 
there's going to be a large windfall of cash that's going to come in. And that money is not going to get squandered. It's not going to disappear or get, oh, I paid off the mortgage and I went off, a, went on a trip and then the money's gone forever. No, they have a system. They have a process to follow and they know exactly what to do with the money. They're going to backfill their policies and make sure that their policy loans are paid. They're going to not steal a piece. And then they're going to start even more policies on kids, grandkids, grandkids, and so on into the next generation to keep that multi-generational wealth effect going. And again, you can do this too. It's as simple as that. Over the course of your lifetime, think about all of the money that's leaving your family for things that you just need to get like mortgages, investments, and cars, and properties, weddings, taxes, tuition, like the list goes on and on the things that need to be paid for business loans, insurance, uh, personal expenses, business expenses, RVs, vacation, sports, like hobbies, why not have more capital so you can actually enjoy and do more things. And I want to point out this one here, insurance. Uh, I think that's a really powerful one. I personally have changed all of my home and auto insurance premiums to annual. And I use policy loans to pay those annual premiums so that the, the money that was leaving $420 a month, I would still have to make that payment. I'm paying it back to my own system. So I at least get use and control over that capital for the 11 months where it isn't needed at the uh, general insurance company. Now add up all of the money that you've earned and spent to this point in your life. Just think about all of that capital. Now, could you write a check for that amount of money right now? Most people would absolutely say no. This is a great quote from Jason. He says, have the banking process work for you rather than against you. Now, you don't have to get a policy with us, okay? Or a system of policies from us. There are a lot of great people out there who you can work with. Now, of course, we absolutely hold ourselves as the gold standard as it relates to this process, but we want to make sure that you please do not try to do this on your own. It's really important that you work with a good coach. Now, households and business owners who do this right all have a good coach, and I recommend you get a good coach. Make sure that uh, we're going to, we're going to, like think about for a second, think about the greatest hockey player that the world, uh, many people argue that uh, the world's ever seen, always had a great coach. Whoever your favorite hockey player, football player, MMA fighter, singer, I don't, even coaches, they all have coaches. They all work with a good coach. And now when you, uh, when you choose who you're going to do uh, business with or who you're going to work with on this process, here are some things for you to think about. Number one, You've got to be careful about the life carrier that you put your policy with and ensure that the policy is designed properly. This isn't just any old life insurance policy or even any old whole life or even a dividend paying whole life policy. It is structured and engineered very specific in a very specific way in the regular or average life insurance advisor. God bless them, probably doing really good work. But we have some very specific training and experience with implementing this process and how to structure these policies correctly. And every single member of our team practices and implements the process of becoming your own banker. So we're actually practicing what we teach other people. So that's something that you should look out for as well. Uh, most people who are selling life insurance don't actually have the experience in this area. So make sure that you work with somebody who specializes in becoming your own banker. Number three, you should choose someone who is an authorized infinite banking practitioner through the Nelson Nash Institute. There's an actual program, a study, a curriculum that we went through. So here's what that means. The reason you should do this uh, in your life is because you deserve the outcome now, right? And when is the best time to get started at anything? When's the best time to plant a tree? Well, the age old thing is 20 years ago, but the next best time is right now. The longer you wait, the more you're going to penalize yourself. And the real questions are, what is the cost of doing nothing? That's the ultimate cost. It costs everything. And what's the cost of just one more year of all of your money leaving your family or your business permanently? What's the cost of giving up all of the interest your money could have otherwise earned? I showed you that example earlier. So now we're going to do a quick recap here, just uh, respecting the use of time. We're getting close. Let's do a recap. The difference between you being stressed or staying relaxed financially is who controls the banking function in your life. 
You don't have to put your money in prison for decades and rely on somebody else to achieve the financial abundance that you deserve today. And you don't have to be rich to become your own banker. We have people putting as little as $2,500 a year into a policy system, well over a quarter of a million dollars a year into a system. So if you're somewhere between those two numbers, you can get started. Uh, my colleague Sarbelo often shares that when he first started his system, his first policy was only, I think it was $2,400 a year because that's what he could do. Well, whatever you can do, that's what you should do. This process looks awesome, but how will I know if it's a right fit? How will I know if it works for me? Well, schedule your call. Again, text the word schedule to 780-809-4599. And once you have a conversation with one of our colleagues, if we establish a good basis to work together, then they'll guide you to the next step. You may need to consume some more content or some YouTube content, or get, you know, there might, you might just not be at that point in the learning journey where you're ready to actually meet and take a deeper dive, because we want to make sure that you receive the most amount of value from the process. And the way that you're going to receive the most amount of value is to be a self-starter, take initiative, take control, make sure you get the proper content, make sure you consume the, 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 the uh, videos on our YouTube channel, and then once we get to that point, you're actually going to schedule a clarity meeting. So that'll be a 60 minute Zoom call where you can take a deeper dive into the process and we'll look specifically at your situation and determine uh, if it's going to be a good fit and what those next steps are going to be. Now, this all sounds great, but I don't want to do it alone. Of course, we encourage you not to do this alone. Uh, you will not be alone because what comes with working with our team is you're going to receive a lifetime of mentoring. There's going to be a quarterly group coaching session. In fact, we have a quarterly group coaching session coming up this Saturday for our clients. And, uh, and, and everyone on our team is going to be on that call. And literally hundreds of our clients will be on that call joining us to get some more advanced uh, coaching and some specific examples and things that will allow them to get the creative process rolling and learn more about how to expand and how to apply their system. We have uh, multiple uh, uh, channels or multiple forms of, of, of ways to educate uh, educate you. So we have uh, uh, more valuable resources. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. You can see that we have audio. So we have the Wealth Without Bay Street podcast. You can look for Wealth Without Bay Street on any of your popular podcast platforms that you uh, prefer. If you like to listen on the go or you like the audio effect, listen to the Wealth Without Bay Street podcast. Uh, we also have our uh, bookstore, with our best selling books there. And then we have YouTube videos, Bankers Vault YouTube channel here. Don't be afraid to uh, subscribe, watch some videos. Now I'll, I'll show you a little trick here. You can see that we have uh, just the home screen. We have the video section where you can kind of look through all the videos. Look at all this great content that's been posted here, all my teammates there. But you might be thinking, oh, you know what? Like, Vern, I want to focus on, uh, I want to learn about debt. How do I get myself out of debt? You can search and then we have all these great videos that'll come up the fastest way to pay off debt. This is a great video right here. There's all kinds. And then there's even a playlist that comes up Well, you might say, oh, well, I want to learn about real estate. And then all of a sudden, oh, look at this real estate investment strategies in Canada. So there's all these other videos that are going to come up that can teach you how to do real estate. Here is our bookstore, Ascendant Financial. So if you get a book from us, we'll ship it. Or when you get a book from us, we'll ship it right to your door anywhere in Canada. Uh, we don't send it through snail mail. We send it uh, through, uh, I think usually we use, I believe, Pure or Later. Don't quote me on that, but it'll come to your door usually within about a day or two. These are kind of our best sellers, but there are some really great uh, resources here. In fact, uh, I was on a call the other day with uh, a CPA, a professional, a chartered accountant. And um, I said, hey, you know, you might get a lot of value out of, out of uh, uh, there's a book here, Confessions of a CPA. There's a lot of really great resources on this bookstore. Again, like I said, we have coaching. We're going to have this quarterly coaching session coming up, but we also have, you can see here just in the light, we have a client portal. A lot of our clients say to us, oh gosh, Vern, like I really want to be there on Saturday, but you know, I've got some other obligation. So what happens is if you miss the quarterly coaching session or any of our other exclusive content that gets posted, so all of the things get archived on the client portal. All right, so this is a view of our portal and it's got a nice little opening video that our colleague Richard does just to welcome you. 
And then there's a bunch of categories that you can go in here. So what we were talking about is, is some of the coaching information that's available. So if you go into the portal, this is on demand. Whenever you have the time and you want to do a deeper dive on a multitude of things, it's here. So what we're going to look at today is like some of the client coaching sessions. So this was one that we did earlier this year on, uh, you know, February. And Dan, and those was... check marks there are representing that you actually, you two took in that content. So it kind of gives you a log of what studying yep. that you've already done, right? That's exactly right. And uh, awesome. anyone can go in and watch what we reviewed as, you know, during that client, client coaching session. If they're a client, they get access to all this. And, you know, we have some great breakout groups that we, you know, we have happening during that event. And we just go through a number of topics. And uh, this is, you know, this is where Jason went through in detail about his family banking system and how he set it up. And then, you know, the a meeting agenda and Richard talking about that. So there's lots of topics there and just all kinds of pieces. Like if you, if you want to watch stuff related to, you know, Nelson Nash, like there's interviews that you know, were done with Nelson. There's just all kinds of great information, you know, banking profits, what's the real o ORI, all kinds of information here that, you know, webinars that people can take in. I like these, you know, frequently asked questions Mm. that are that are listed in here and you know people can just go and look like you know things like you know how often are dividends declared and credited like if you can't remember that well you simply just go in here and you can just click on it and pretty much everyone's going to be a video and this is a servo talking about dividends and how they're declared so Lots of great information in there, Vern. Also, again, learning more about who Nelson Nash uh, is would be, you know, really great for you just to learn, you know, the, his character and what he cared about and, and who he really was and his journey. So we have uh, Remembering Nelson. There's nelsonnashfilm.com. That's nelsonnashfilm.com. It's the one-hour documentary that really just gives us an insight of who Nelson was and a bit more about the process of becoming your own banker and how it came to be. If you understand the problem, the solution will become clear and you will know exactly what you can do. And that was kind of the theme tonight is it's all about what you can do. And that's our Nelson Nash, the developer, the pioneer of the process of becoming your own banker, the infant banking concept. Oh no, this one here, this uh, slide here is a little bit of a white lie. I got to tell you, I don't know if that's a, uh, a taboo term, but this um, we have 365 five-star Google reviews. That is actually uh, not accurate. We have, I think, well over 500 five-star Google reviews at this time. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that we really enjoy here at Ascendant Financial is we love raving five-star Google reviews. Again, no pressure at all, but if you have received some good value tonight, even if it wasn't great, if you've got some feedback, good, bad, and, and all the rest is uh, always uh, welcome. And again, I don't think you get those kind of reviews unless there's some kind of value being added. So this is just, a, I'm not going to read these, but it's just some snapshots of some of our uh, past attendees and our clients who are sharing uh, good reviews and, and some of the value that they received. I wanted to, this is on our website. You can actually go to meet our team. And if you go ahead and click on one of our teammates, you can actually kind of learn more about our teammates. Everybody on our team is fantastic. Each and every one of our teammates will take really great care of and do a good job coaching and implement the process. And so if you want to get to know our team a little bit better, even if you're working with another person, you can, we are a team. We're here to support each other. We collaborate very, very often on our team. We believe that collaboration eliminates competition. So, cause we're, we're not here for us. We're here for you. That's what we're here for. So these are all of our advisor teammates, uh, a bunch of fantastic uh, individuals. And there's a uh, Richard that I mentioned earlier. That's the gentleman who was my original uh, my first mentor in this industry and introduced me to Ascendant Financial, uh, the great and powerful Star Bill Gill, and of course, Jason Lowe, the founder and pioneer, or the founder uh, of, uh, and CEO of Ascendant Financial. And then we have, uh, we have our client success team. So they're uh, supporting uh, new clients and making sure that, that you're empowered and set up correctly. We have the new business team. So these are the wonderful ladies who take you through the life insurance application process and make sure you're, you're well looked after. And we have our strategic assistants. Uh, nothing happens around here without the strategic assistants. Ashley's my strategic assistant and she is absolutely fantastic. Operations team, uh, Devin was on the call earlier. He was the one who responsible for uh, that really awesome playlist that we had at the beginning. And I'm going to tell you that these 
Uh, these people are hard to keep up with because they're all uh, ambitious and they're fantastic people and, and my life is better just for having them. We have strategic uh, partners as well. So if we need some good guidance in terms of uh, tax and estate planning or positioning uh, 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 corporate policies or uh, those more kind of in-depth strategies that we need, we want to make sure that we have uh, the right who. We got to have, it's all about who not how, right? We got to have the right who for the job. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm some kind of tax expert, which I'm not. It's not an area that I'm really strong in. So what I do is I'm going to tap a teammate on the shoulder, whether that be uh, uh, even uh, my good friend, Henry. Uh, he's a, a chartered accountant by trade as well, but he's uh, so inspired by what we do here at Ascendant Financial that he completely switched gears. But we have all these resources to support you and empower you to become your own banker and make sure that things are set up uh, correctly so that you can receive the most value and achieve uh, all those objectives that you want to achieve. So if all this process did was keep more money in your family or in your business, would it be worth it? If all this process did was create a peaceful, stress-free financial way of life, would that be worth it? The power of commitment. I heard a long, long time ago from a long, long time ago, I heard back in 2011, I'm so behind the times with things. That's when I first started watching YouTube. And I heard of this gentleman called John Astaroff. He's a, from Montreal, he's a Canadian guy, but I think it was Remax that he got kind of way up there. I think he ended up owning Remax or something at one point. But the point is, is I was watching this video and he said, you know, a lot of people are interested in things. People are interested in creating wealth, interested in getting healthy, interested in starting a business. But then when you're interested in things, you allow roadblocks and life circumstances to get in your way and it stops you. But when you're committed to things, the whole entire, it's like the Red Sea parts, the whole world changes for you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have challenges, but you're going to go over, through, around. The right coach or mentor or resource is going to show up to help keep moving you forward. There's a big difference between being interested and being committed to something. So the power of commitment to yourself, that's what's going to make the difference. Now, you do have some options, though. That's the good news. Options are good. First option is do nothing, and you'll continue to, to uh, uh, nothing will change, and you'll continue to work your butt off for the banks, and everyone else will continue to get your money. The second option is to schedule your discovery call and take a hold of your personal finances and put control back in your own hands. Now, if you were committed, if you're committed, what would you do? Question is, are you committed? Now, I'm living proof of this. I want you to picture a day. Picture a day when financial control is back in your hands, not the banks, government, or a risky stock market. When your spouse actually says thank you for not making me wait 30 years to enjoy the lifestyle that I want today. When your finances are exactly where you want them to be, and you know with certainty that you have the freedom to travel when you want to travel, relax when you want to relax, and serve when you want to serve. You need the use of money until the end of time. That's just how it works. Nothing happens to the flow of money without the function of banking. It's all about the process of banking. Banking is the most important business, as we said earlier. And you need to exchange money for goods, for investments, and services that you will need. And that's so key because a lot of times people want to collapse this process with investments. I can use my policy system to pay off my vehicle and recapture that payment, or I can use my policy system to invest in something. Now, real estate market goes up, cash value goes up. Stock market goes up, cash value goes up. Crypto goes up, cash value goes up. If those all go down, cash value goes up. So I'm hedging my, hedging my bets. I use my policy system to finance all of my investments. Now, in life, payments are not going to stop. They're not going to end. But you can certainly change who is getting the money, who's getting those payments, and who that money is being put to work for. This is uh, the great and powerful Sarblo Gill. There's a great question. We get this one lots, Fern. And uh, what happens if someone's non-insurable? So that's, that's a fact of life, right? Not everybody's insurable. And uh, as you know, you would learn if you read the book, uh, you know, you find someone who you have an insurable interest in. So whether that's a, you know, a child, a spouse, a business partner, uh, 
you find someone else and you can still practice this process very successfully owning the policy on someone else as the life insured. So that's what happens if someone is non-insurable. Would you mind sharing, like, do you own some policies on someone else's life other than your own? Oh, definitely. So I have uh, policies on my children and uh, that's what I've had to expand my system to, to not because I'm not insurable, but it's just an option I had. But yeah, that would be the same. I would, you know, if I wasn't insurable today and I started another policy, I would, it would be on one of my children or one of my grandchildren. Yeah, there, there was a time where a couple of years ago, I actually wasn't insurable and I had to do some pretty dramatic actions to change my health. But prior to that, I mean, I still own the policies, but all the policies that we owned in our family system at that time were on my wife and my two kids. And I've since added two policies on my own life. So thank the higher power of your choice that I was able to get that approved. Starting a new policy, how can I immediately borrow money when cash is not yet accumulated in the policy? Oh, that's a great question. Well, that's one of the reasons why we said earlier that it's really important that you work with a good coach, the proper company, and the policy is designed correctly. Now, depending on how the policy is capitalized, the way that you decide to capitalize the policy and, and deposit your premium, you're going to be able to access policy loans from your system within the very first month of the policy being in force. So, you know, it's a long-term process, but we don't have to wait 5, 10, 15, 20 years for that cash to accumulate. We can start implementing the process immediately. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it, and it varies from life company to life company, and that's what we do. We help set you up to meet your objective. And, you know, there's, there is some life companies in Canada that you, you can't borrow in the first year, but there's a lot that you can. So, again, depending on a person's objective, we would set you up with, uh, the, you know, a life company that works for you. There may be a limit as to how much one can purchase, you know, how much life insurance one can purchase. So there is a limit. And the life company will only let you have so much life insurance on your life or anyone's life because there's all you know and the, what's required is there has to be a reason there has to be a purpose for that life insurance so they're asking well how do i you increase that well you know real realistically there's a few ways to do that now it's going to be based on partially income replacement how you're structured in your family it gets pretty complicated to get into all those nuances that you have to be aware of but uh cool. you know you increase your net worth you can increase the amount of of uh, life insurance you can have on but that's why sometimes you have to use someone else besides yourself as a life insured because hey you know this is this whole process is based at using the platform of dividend paying whole life insurance because it's the best tool we found to practice banking at the you and me level. Now, so there's a way to, to work around, you know, those situations. You have all the death benefit you can have. And that's something that we'd love to talk to you about. And I just encourage whoever has that question just to reach out to one of our coaches and we'll go through that in more detail. Ben, and that would be why you would have a coach though, right? Because part of our role is to really position the case with the life carrier and, and show them why this case that we put together actually makes sense. Why is this solution make sense? And think about life events, baby, marriage, home, started a business, got, sold a house, got a windfall of capital. Those are all, they could be reasons that would allow you to expand your banking system on your own life. So if I'm tapped out today, it doesn't mean that's forever. There's another great question about, and I get this one, you know, every once in a while when I was, as I'm speaking to people, Vern, it's like, so can, you know, can I avoid the bank altogether? Like, can I deposit my paycheck right into the, my banking system with the life company? Well, the answer in Canada presently is no, you have to go through a commercial bank. And so what I presently do when I get paid, it goes into a commercial bank. And then from there, I use that as quick as I can to pay premiums or policy loan repayments. So that's the reality of it. So you do have to use a bank and we can't get around that the way our laws are structured and processes are structured in Canada. You have to keep a bank account. You have to use a bank account. When Nelson talked about that's not doing business with the bank, he's talking about, you know, don't 
use a bank to cause inflation through Paul, you know, through loans that you're using there. And that's more the way he's talking about than just like Nelson, right? To the last day that he lived on earth, he was still using the commercial bank for the convenience of debit or checking. Dan and I both uh, are at the point now where we're able to use our policy system for all of our living expenses. So if you want to kind of get a really good example of what that looks like, Dan, by the way, I've gotten some amazing feedback on that video. I don't know if, if you have, but they said, holy smokes, Dan did such a great job. So um, if you want to go ahead and watch this video, Dan and I walk you through how we uh, actually operate our own family banking system and how we use it to pay for all of our lifestyle expenses. So Sorry. it's a really great resource. It's an interesting question. They said, so if we buy a policy else, elsewhere, how does that benefit you? And if it doesn't benefit, why would you share that? So I, I love that question. I just thought it was a great question. And, and one of the things that we truly believe in, this is how I would answer, Vern, I'll let you answer it after, sure. is we want to educate people. We want to, we're trying to get to a point where 10% of, of you know, Canada starts to practice this. And if they do that, we're going to make a difference out there in the world. So we're really about educating people on this concept. And if they choose to do it with somebody else, that's okay. Well, we're gonna, we know that we can do a great job of helping them, but still, we just want them to understand the opportunity they have and for them and their family. So that's why we do this. And yeah, we still make a living doing this. So we appreciate it when people work with us <laughs> and we think we are, like you said, gold, you know, Vern, I think we, I believe we are a gold standard when it comes to, you know, this concept of, in Canada. Like Jason was mm. one of two people that brought this concept to Canada. And every year, you know, we go to think tank and we just continue to develop our skill set, learning more from people across North America that are practicing this just so we can bring value. So to your point, I mean, Jason and Richard, you know, they mentored directly under Nelson for many years. Yep. And uh, the, the, the reality of it is, it, it's not about us. It, it's about you. It's about Canada. It's about getting people free. And it's about an abundant mindset. Like there is way too many people to help. There's way too many people that need to learn about this process and to implement this process. So the reality of it is we need a little bit of help anyway. So if there's a good fit here with us, awesome. We're more than happy to help. But if you find somebody that you connect with, that you jive with, all our only hope is that you work with somebody who can really give you the good guidance that you need. That's the main objective.